Hey guys, welcome back to Wrestle News 365. Hope everyone is doing very, very well, having a good Monday. As always, there is a ton of news stories to get into today. So let's get straight into the news and let's kick off with an injury update on Kevin Owens. Now, of course, this past Friday night on SmackDown, we saw an injury angle at the end of the show where Kevin Owens, former WWE Universal Champion, was thrown out of the WWE Thunderdome by the current WWE Universal Champion Roman Reigns. Now, WWE has announced storyline injuries to Kevin Owens coming out of uh, this week's New Year's edition of SmackDown on Fox. As I mentioned, SmackDown ended with Kevin Owens defeating Jay Uso in the main event. But after the match, Owen attacks uh, Uso and handcuffed him in the ring for a beatdown in an attempt to bait out WWE Universal Champion Roman Reigns to the ring. Now, Kevin Owens then beat Uso around the stage area and over to one of the Thunderdome crowd platforms where suddenly the big dog, the tribal chief, the head of the table, Roman Reigns, attacked him out of nowhere. Now, Reigns and Uso then turned things around on Kevin Owens, and as the show went off the air, Reigns threw KO from a platform up high, down below, through a table. Now, since then, WWE has announced a storyline update and noted that Kevin Owens was taken to a local medical facility. You remember that period of time around, it was early, a couple of months ago, where suddenly WWE started to use the term hospital again, like living you know, in the real world, but the local medical facility is back because Kevin Owens has been sent there after the attack on Friday and has been diagnosed with bruised kidneys and a spinal contusion. Now, there's no word yet on what WWE has planned for this Kevin Owens Roman Reigns feud after the events of SmackDown on Friday, but it looks like Kevin Owens could be out of the ring for a week or so due to these storylines injuries. Now, what I find interesting about that, first of all, I thought SmackDown, once again, very, very good on Friday. Was it as good as the Christmas Day edition? No. Um, obviously, I think... There were many factors involved in that. Three title matches, steel cage match, etc. Um, it wasn't as good a show as the week prior, but it was still nevertheless an enjoyable show. SmackDown is an enjoyable show every every Friday night. I think the, 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 the disparity between Raw and SmackDown now is just gargantuan, really, in terms of quality and storytelling done on both shows. It's, it's crazy to think that one company is capable of producing a show like Raw on Monday and then SmackDown on Friday, considering now it's actually technically the same creative team overseen by Bruce Pritchard that does both shows. It's madness to me. Nevertheless, I, I'll stay, say the same what I've said all the, all the way through when it comes to this Kevin Owens Roman Reigns storyline that I think is exactly the same as the Jey Uso Roman Reigns storyline in the sense that Jey Uso versus Roman Reigns was only scheduled to be a one pay-per-view deal. It was meant to be a Clash of the Champions back in September and basically what would happen in that it was just it was a vehicle to cement the Roman Reigns heel turn. Roman Reigns against his own cousin beats up his own cousin, destroys his own cousin. We're then completely sure as a fan, as an audience watching, Roman Reigns is definitely a heel. That's what we were going to get from that storyline. The issue was is that it was so good and it was so good that they had to continue it and they moved it over to Hell in a Cell as well. And technically, Jey Uso is still a massive, massive part of this storyline going forward. So they've extended all of this. Why? Because the Jey Uso uh, match at Clash of Champions, the Jey Uso story going into Clash of Champions was so good. And I think it's the same with Kevin Owens and Roman Reigns right now. Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns to me initially just felt like, okay, Roman Reigns is going to be doing big stuff come 2021, come the Royal Rumble, come WrestleMania, etc. What we need right now is just a filler storyline, a filler angle to do for December and do for TLC. That was Kevin Owens. The issue is, once again, that it's been incredibly good, incredibly successful. The quality, the story, the matches, everything has just been excellent. And if something's working in the case of pro wrestling, and WWE sometimes does and doesn't go with storylines if they're working or not, we criticize them for being so steadfast on certain elements of this is what Vince McMahon wants, it's only going to be a one-shot deal, then they move on. But recently, especially with the Roman Reigns character and the Roman Reigns storylines, they've been quite flexible, I think, in the sense that, look, if something's working, if something's popular, if something is good quality content, and most importantly, if it's continuing to get over Roman Reigns as that top heel in WWE, as the top guy in WWE, they'll carry on with it. And that's the same with Kevin Owens right now. It's popular. It's working. I want to see more matches. I want to see the storyline continue. And to me, it looks very, very likely, I would suspect, that this is going to carry on at least until the Royal Rumble. Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens have fantastic chemistry. And I would love to see another match. And I think the important thing when it comes to Kevin Owens is, like I said before, this goes to show the importance of Kevin Owens to WWE. Kevin Owens in 2020 didn't do a hell of a lot of 
stuff on TV. He was there. He was a baby face on Raw, had the feud of Seth Rollins at WrestleMania. But then due to a variety of reasons, reasons injuries, uh, taking time away, not feeling comfortable performing during the pandemic, etc., etc., he didn't do a lot. He was doing the KO show. He was just there. I think back to SummerSlam. There's a SummerSlam or Payback. He was on commentary for a Street Profits tag team title match. And that's no disrespect to the Street Profits or anyone like that, but it's more of a case of it's Kevin Owens. He's a second ever Universal Champion. He's a main eventer. And he's sitting there on commentary just, you know, hi. It, he's, he's better than that. But this whole feud of Roman Reigns is going to show the importance of someone like Kevin Owens because he can go from months of doing nothing and nothing uh, you know, creatively worthwhile. He can go straight into a main event program like that and be completely not out of place, fit in smoothly. And now, to me, he's proved a much more valuable asset to WWE because we know Kevin Owens can work as a heel, right? Kevin Owens is a heel. He's one of the best heels in the company. But now, Kevin Owens as a babyface is showing this side to me that I don't think so many people thought he was capable of. To me right now, he reminds me of Mick Foley. Mick Foley, Mankind, 98, 99, that is Kevin Owens right now. He's the family man, gets beat up over and over and over and over again. Maybe he doesn't win the big match, but he's lovable, he's likable, and he's relatable. And I think that's what Kevin Owens is right now. He's Mankind in 98, 99. And I think he's a fantastic, fantastic um, person to do that role. I think, he, I think it works fantastically. So... That's an update on, on Kevin Owens. And actually, speaking of Mick Foley himself, we actually have a good update when it comes to Mick Foley after his positive test results last week. Now, as I uh, we spoke about before, and it's been widely reported online, uh, on January 1st, Mick Foley revealed that he tested positive for coronavirus on December 12th. Now, he's been under quarantine in a hotel room for the past 19 days. Today, in a Facebook post, or a couple of days ago in a Facebook post, Mick Foley revealed he'll be checking out of the hotel today because he is no longer contagious. The WWE Hall of Famer thanked fans for the well wishes and prayers he received on social media and said he was lucky because things could have been worse. Foley also revealed that he donated $5,000 uh, from his cameo, December cameo earnings to the Daniela Conte Foundation. Since the pandemic, McFoley has had 12 tests and back in April he was un in self-isolation for a few weeks due to COVID-19 concerns. Of course, I think everyone would agree here, the fact that Mick Foley looks to be on the mend and he's no longer contagious and he's got through hopefully the worst of all of this is fantastic to hear. Obviously, the pandemic is still going. I know so many people, myself included, was very happy to see the back of 2020. But ultimately, even in 2021, the pandemic is still real and we're still in the current climate that we are. And you can't be too careful. And uh, thankfully, as I mentioned, Mick Foley, WWE Hall of Fame, a pro wrestling icon, uh, is now on the mend and hopefully will be allowed to go back home and see his family. Uh, credit to Mick as well for self-isolating in a hotel room. You know, he thought, thought about the priorities and thought about the health of his family and his loved ones, and that's absolutely commendable. So uh, good to hear that Mick Foley is on the mend and good to hear that hopefully now he'll be able to go home uh, very soon. I want to talk about as well, because there were some really disturbing things happened in social media over the weekend regarding Brody Lee and Brody Lee Jr. and social media accounts. And it's just, uh, it, I mean, I know I'm going to start ranting here, but it, it's ridiculous. It really is. So AEW and Amanda Huber, the wife of Brody Lee, are now warning fans after someone fooled than, fans um, that there was this fake account of Amanda and Brody Lee Jr. on Twitter overnight. Now, this fake Brody Lee Jr. account was actually created back in July, which led to some fans wondering if it was legitimate or not. If it was legitimate or not. Uh, but both of the fake accounts have since been deleted and confirmed to be fake from the real Amanda and AEW. Now, AEW actually tweeted about this because basically there was this Brody Lee Jr. Twitter account that was posting pictures of Brody Lee Jr., the family, and uh, posting pictures of uh, Brody Lee Jr. and his dad, and saying, I love you, dad, and stuff like that. And it led to a lot of people saying, well, Brody Lee Jr., he was on TV, he was on Dynamite. We've seen a lot of him on social media through other people's accounts ever since the passing of Brody Lee. So people thought, oh, maybe this is just Brody Lee Jr. being put on social media. We don't know. I immediately was skeptical because the, the kid's eight years old, and... You know, this is a this is a difficult and tragic time for him and the family. And I was I, at the time I was suspicious, as I mentioned, that account was made back in July as well, which is a red flag. 
And then it was subsequently revealed that the account was indeed fake. Now, AEW tweeted about this saying, quote, if there ever, if there is ever an official slash real account for anyone associated with AEW, it would be promoted and followed by AEW. Beware of individuals pretending to be members of the Huber family. Now, Amanda Huber, of course, Brody Lee's widow, took to her Instagram story and commented on a screenshot of the fake Brody Lee Jr. account, confirming her son has no social media accounts. She said, quote, Brody has no social media accounts. This is so weird and just gross. She then commented on another screenshot of an imposter sharing a photo of Brody Jr. and uh, his mother. She said, quote, never in his life as Brody called me mommy and it's bizarre to read. Please, if you feel yourself creating a fake account for an eight-year-old for attention, please go to therapy and get the help you need. I'm serious. Therapy is amazing and world-changing. It's changed my life personally. Also, this isn't okay. Now, Amanda then reacted to a fake account reporting the fake Brody Jr. account and said, quote, a fake account pretending to be me is reporting the fake account of someone pretending to be my eight-year-old. What? I have Twitter, but I hardly use it and it's been on private for years. Now, Stu Grayson of the Dark Order, AEW wrestler, also warned fans before the imposter was deleted, writing, quote, do not follow this account. It's a fake. Unfortunately, it seems like people can't stop themselves from being, and we won't finish it there. Now, this... I mean, the, the, I mean, I'm I'm lost for words. I'm lost for words because just as you start to have a bit of faith back in humanity again, and you start to feel like the pro wrestling community as a whole came together and celebrated the life and mourned the passing of Brody Lee, you have just despicable and disgusting people on there. And I try not to lose my faith in humanity over stuff like this because, on the whole, look, the whole the tributes to Brody Lee, the mourning of his passing, the way that. AEW fans, WWE fans, they're just pro wrestling fans in general and the wider community of social media came together and celebrated the life and celebrated the man, the husband, the father that John Huber was. It, it was it was heartbreaking but heartwarming at the same time and it was it was emotional but it was fantastic to see. And then over the course of and I guess this is maybe part of the course of any tragedy, but it shouldn't be. You have people that are just disgusting. What would possess someone? What would possess someone to make a fake account for an eight-year-old child just for attention? Just for attention. There is something deeply disturbed about that person that feels they need to do that. And I agree with Amanda. If, you do, if you're doing that and you find yourself that that's what you're doing, get help. Seriously, get help. Because that is insane. That is absolutely insane. It's despicable. It's disgusting. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, legally as well. Shouldn't there be something about that as well? It's just, pretending to be an eight-year-old child is one thing. Pretending to be an eight-year-old child who just lost their father through a tragic illness over the case of a couple of months around the holiday period during this horrible and horrific time where you're grieving and you're mourning and then you go on social media. Imagine you're Amanda. Put yourself in Amanda's shoes. Not only are you now a widow and you're trying to, Pick up the pieces of your life as they've fallen down and crashed around you. Your husband passed away, your best friend, the father of your children. And this is still only, what, a couple of a couple of weeks old at this point? It's still incredibly, incredibly raw. You're still going through the early stages of the grieving process. And you have to put up with BS reporters claiming conspiracy theories and BS journalists saying they need to have more information because he's a public figure. And then you have to go on social media and see people pretending to be your eight-year-old son. What is wrong with people? What is wrong with people? It's just, it's beyond disturbing. It's beyond disturbing. Now, I'm glad to see so many people immediately say, this is BS, this is wrong, this is disgusting, and reported the account straight away. And maybe we shouldn't even be talking about it on here, right? Maybe we shouldn't be talking about it. Maybe wrestling websites shouldn't be even be shining the attention on it because that's what they want. That's what they're getting is attention, right? They're getting the attention they want. But it's wrong. It's just fundamentally wrong. And I don't, I just, I can't comprehend what goes through people's heads. I just can't comprehend what, what goes through people's, through people's heads in those situations. It's just, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. And if you ever see any account like that, do what I guess would probably be your moral duty at this point and report them, get rid of them. But not only do they not deserve to be on social media, but they don't deserve to be part of the pro wrestling community as a whole. Because it's just wrong. It's just wrong and it's, it's sickening and it's disgusting. And I, I mean, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about it. But it's just, if you're one of those people, 
you know, get off social media, go check to a therapist's office or something like that. Because that's obviously, obviously what you need in that situation. It's it's horrendous. Now, T-Bar, Dominic Dajakovic, WWE superstar, has also called out wrestling personalities, wrestling journalists, anyone involved in pro wrestling over the Brody Lee passing. Because WWE superstar T-Bar took to social media earlier to call out wrestlers who share conspiracy theories over the passing of John Huber, a.k.a. Brody Lee, Luke Harper, now, of course, Brody Lee passed away last Saturday at the age of 41 due to a non-COVID lung issue. Now, the Retribution member tweeted, quote, If you're a wrestling personality and you decide that you have a hot take that disrespects the Huber family, do me a favor. Take your conspiracy theory and go F yourself with it. Now, as reported, Brody Lee's wife, Amanda, had to actually respond to theories about there being a cover-up and her husband passing away with COVID-19. Again, just horrendous. This is what she had to say, quote, there is no cover up. There's no conspiracy. There was just a series of unfortunate events that ended ended in your world being crushed. What kind of position does that put you in when you're trying to grieve and people practically expect you to post medical records because since they were a public figure, they are entitled to the full knowledge of what happened, end quote. Now, again, we've spoken about this before, so I don't really want to talk about it that much again because it's just... Again, it's like with that fake account that we just spoke about a minute ago. It's disgusting is what it is. It's ultimately, it's disgusting and it's wrong. And people, I'm glad to see that the likes of PW Torch, they've got rid of the, the I don't know, I'm not even going to call him a journalist, the person that, that wrote that column about Brody Lee and saying, we need transparency, we need transparency. And I've seen some other people involved in pro wrestling say, we need transparency. They're not being honest. Not everything is a conspiracy theory. I understand there is a lot of misinformation on social media. And I understand given the current climate, whether it's with the pandemic or politically, there's things you do and don't believe. But when a grieving widow has to come out only days, days after her husband, her best friend, the father of her children passed away and dispel conspiracy theories by people that are not doctors, people that are not in the know, people that just want attention on social media, people that want the clicks, people that want to be talked about, people that want to be the center of attention when it's not about them and she feels she has to respond to that. It's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. And Dominic Dajakovic there is right. Take those conspiracy theories and shove them where the sun doesn't shine. Because it's no business. It's no business. Nobody's medical condition is anyone's business. If we'd have just if it just come out and said Brody Lee passed away, that would be that would be okay. That would be okay in the sense of we don't need any more information. We don't. Yes, he's a public figure. We get that. But private medical conditions, right? So so the guy that wrote that article, we can know everything about your medical history, okay? Well, you're a public figure if you're online too. It's ridiculous. It's ri it's ridiculous. It's people being nosy. It's people looking for conspiracies where there are none. It's people not accepting facts and people trying to butt into people's private lives during a period of mourning and grieving. And it's disgusting. It's disgusting. And as time goes on, as I mentioned, with these people still peddling these conspiracy theories, still putting up fake social media accounts and still talking in disrespectful ways, it's only been a couple of weeks. You know, you should just, again... Don't go on social media because you, you, I know social media is meant to be for everyone, but it's not for people who are spreading those conspiracy theories, being disrespectful about uh, to, a, to a, a widow. And she feels she has to justify herself for her husband passing away. Are you kidding me? It's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridic ridiculous. Now, in a more lighthearted uh, tribute to Brody Lee, I wanted to share this as well because neon graffiti artist David Speed created a mural in honor of Brody Lee, John Huber. Uh, David Speed shared his artwork on Twitter, I believe it was yesterday, with a caption saying, quote, Rest in peace, Brody Lee. As you can see there, I mean, look at that. That is absolutely beautiful. It's, I mean, as a, just in terms of an art piece, it's, it's fantastically well done and it's beautiful in itself. But as just as a tribute to Brodie Lee, that is absolutely spectacular. It's awesome. And that currently is in London, England. Uh, so it's available to see. I don't know specifically where it is in London, but somewhere in London, there is a brick wall with a big neon graffiti uh, tribute to Brodie Lee. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? As someone from the UK, that makes me so proud that someone went all to that effort to pay tribute to Brodie Lee. And it's absolutely spectacular. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, we've had a couple of reactions to it on social media. 
Uh, current AEW EVP Cody Rhodes commented on Speed's uh, tribute saying, quote, great job, David. Dustin Rhodes retweeted the mural and called it awesome. Uh, AEW's official Twitter account also retweeted the artwork. Speed also shared the mural on Instagram where several commented on it, including Brody Lee's wife, Amanda. She commented, holy SH, you know the rest. Dark Order member Stu Grayson wrote, wow, that's incredible. Heath Slater commented, beautiful brother. And Drake Maverick uh, wrote, amazing. As I mentioned, the mural was created in London, England. And I wanted to share that because, I mean, look at it. It's absolutely, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So credit to David Speed. It's an absolutely beautiful tribute. And as I mentioned, at a time where sometimes you can lose faith in humanity, you see stuff like that. And it's just, it's fantastic to see. It's absolutely spectacular to see. Um, let's move on to another story about Paige. Because speaking of people that shouldn't be on social media and talking about people being disturbing, Paige is now filing a lawsuit against a person who was selling her address online. Yes, that is a real story. How disturbing is this? Now, she revealed that the cops are involved and a report was made. Paige first tweeted, quote, you realize how disgusting this is. You literally tried to get money for our address. You're a terrible person. The cops are involved. A report was put in your name. Numerous people came forward about you with DMs. You changed your Twitter name after being called out. The former NXT Women's Champion then tweeted about how she's using lawyers to get a lawsuit against the person. She wrote, quote, Yeah, using lawyers to get a lawsuit for someone selling our address makes me super. SH, you know the rest. Thanks for making me see the light, bud. Now, last November, Paige and her husband, uh, Ronnie Radke, had to deal with a stalker incident. Paige had explained that the person said, quote, Symbols led him to them. Now, there were some DMs, as I mentioned, shared about trying to sell this address. Now, we won't, we won't share the uh, DMs on here, but I can read some of them to you. She said, uh, in this person said, quote, uh, Hey, I will send you Ronnie's address for $500 and then continue to lower the price as she was selling the, uh, they were selling the, uh, the address, which is just bizarre. I mean, as I mentioned, there are some people on social media that are just, I, I didn't crazy is that the word bad people horrific people i don't know we have seen so many accounts at this point and I, I i dread to think realistically what's actually in the dms of pro wrestlers because you can criticize them for a variety of reasons that's your prerogative but some of the stuff they have to deal with in terms of overzealous fans over the top fandom and just creepiness stalkers all that kind of stuff it's horrendous. It's horrendous. And it kind of goes back to the whole being a public figure situation. They don't deserve that. Yes, they compete on TV and they're celebrities, but they're still a private citizen at the end of the day. You can't show up to their house. You can't send stuff to their house. You can't ask for their address. You just can't do that. Know your boundaries. Know your limits. Be a fan of them on social media. Right, write to them in terms of Twitter and, I don't know, send them fan art on social media. A lot of these people have a P.O. box as well. If you want to send stuff to them to get autographs, do it at a P.O. box. Don't send it to their house. Don't send it to their house. Don't show up to their house. It's this fandom that just goes way, way too far. It's this stan culture that is just kind of out of control and people don't talk about it enough. Sonya Deville, she returned to SmackDown on Friday. We know what happened with her last year, someone showing up to their house attempting to kidnap her. I think back, Gianna Perazzo, Lacey Evans, they've all spoken about it recently, of people sending stuff to their house, to their private addresses. How did they get those addresses? That's a concern, that's a worry. Now I know realistically, you know, if you look hard enough, you might be able to find it, but it doesn't make it right. Don't show up to people's houses, don't send stuff to people's addresses, be fans, be fans, send them stuff on social media, right? Reach out to them on social media. They might write back, they might not. They might have a PA box. If you're that desperate to get in touch with them, do it that way. Because it's all these fans, they like interacting with their, these pro wrestlers. They like interacting with their fans. Fans are the lifeblood of pro wrestling. But it doesn't mean you can show up to their house. And it doesn't mean you can break those boundaries. Respect the boundaries, okay? Because stuff like this is unacceptable. And as Paige mentioned, there's going to be lawsuits. There's going to be lawyers. It's just, it's wrong. It's, it's, fundamentally, it's wrong. And it's disturbing the amount of stories we're seeing like this. As I mentioned, I mentioned there with you know, Paige, Sonia Deville, Lacey Evans, Diana Perazzo. This is an ongoing thing and it's, it's incredibly disturbing. And I can't imagine the stress for those people, what they have to go through. You know, you don't imagine every time you get a knock at the door, you don't know what that knock's going to entail. That's not right. That isn't right. 
And Lacey Evans had to mention about it. She went, well, every time something like this happens, my security system gets upgraded. Because you kind of, not that you're living in terror, but it's got to be something in the back of your mind. And that, again, that's just disturbing. And it's fundamentally wrong. It's just, it's, it's beyond wrong. So, um, I mean, I don't, well, obviously, if something more happens when it comes to this, we'll talk about it here. But hopefully this is the last we have to talk about it. Uh, we have an update as well about the states of Eva Marie with WWE. Because Eva Marie, this has been ongoing for, gosh, since October. I think around October. It was around the time of the draft this was reported that Eva Marie was scheduled to return to WWE. She'd signed a new deal. And we haven't seen anything of her on WWE TV as of yet. But apparently... Eva Marie is getting closer and closer to a WWE return. Now, after months of rumors and speculation, Eva was at one point internally in scheduled to appear on Monday's or tonight's Legends Night on Monday Night Raw. This is according to Fightful Select, which of course is their Patreon service, subscription service, so be sure to subscribe. Now, there's no word on if Eva Marie is still scheduled to be appearing on tonight's show. She's not been advertising any of the Legends Night promos. Of course, there's over 20 Legends have been announced and scheduled for tonight's show. We don't know if Eva Marie is one of them. Maybe because, can you call Eva Marie a legend? <laughs> I don't know. But it was noted that Eva Marie was backstage at the December 14 Raw taping from Tropicana Field and was dressed to do promos. Now, there's no word on where, uh, if or when these promos will air. If in terms they were actually filmed or not, we'll have to wait and see. Now, as I mentioned, it was first reported back in mid-October that Marie was set to return to WWE, possibly as soon as the 2020 WWE Draft edition of Raw on October 12th. But of course, that never happened. Since then, though, Marie has been seen several times at the WWE Performance Center in Orlando. That goes all the way back to September. And another report noted that Marie came to terms on a return contract during the week of September 20. Now, there has been no concrete word as to the plans for Eva Marie's WWE return as of yet. But it was reported in early December that she was listed as a member of WWE's internal roster, despite not officially being a side to a brand as of yet. Now, there's been a lot of speculation on if Eva Marie is returning to wrestle, if she's going to be an on-air personality, if she's going to be a manager, if she's going to be a WWE ambassador. No one really knows, but the fact she's listed on the internal WWE roster would suggest she's going to return in some kind of TV capacity. I don't know if it's going to be as a competitor. Personally, I have no interest in seeing Eva Marie wrestle. Why? Because she's not very good. <laughs> I mean, no offense to her. She might get better, but I don't think how many years? It's three, four years out of the ring. She's not going to have got any better in terms of being a pro wrestler unless she continued pro wrestling, which I don't think she has. She's been acting, modeling, fitness competitor, you name it. I don't think she's been doing any pro wrestling during that period of time. So, I hope she doesn't come back as an active competitor because I don't think she's needed in that role. There are far better female pro wrestlers on the roster on Raw, SmackDown and NXT. Where I do think Eva Marie could be a very valuable asset though to the roster is as a manager or a mouthpiece. Eva Marie can talk. She can talk and she gets people's attention. The fact that there's been so much speculation about Eva Marie returning to WWE shows there is something there about her. Shows that she has this ability to get people talking. Even if it's about her for negative or positive reasons, people talk about Eva Marie. And as a character, she generates heat. She gets eyeballs on the product. So I think she does have something to offer in terms of being a, an active TV performer, just not as a pro wrestler. I always thought, because around the period of time where Eva Marie signed or re-signed with WWE accordingly... There was these Angel Gaza promos, right? They started on Monday Night Raw with him talking about his uh, a secret admirer, someone he was admiring. And I thought eventually that was going to lead to his secret admirer, the person he was uh, sorting after being Eva Marie. And then Eva Marie would be the manager, the mouthpiece or something like that for Angel Gaza. Doesn't look like that's going to be the case now. I still think that pairing works. I think it works really, really well. Gaza is always improving on his English and... His English has improved significantly over the course of the last couple of years. But I think a pairing of Eva Marie, I think, just works. He has the red rose. She has the red hair. If you want to go as simply as that, that works. I think as a package, I think, it, I think it just works really, really well. She might not, though. She might be something completely different. And she might make her return tonight on Raw. It makes sense to return tonight on Raw. Again, is she a legend? No. But she is a former WWE superstar, so it makes sense for her to return on a show where lots of former WWE superstars are returning. And it could be a nice launching point, the first show of Raw for 2021, that she returns to be a full-time role with the company. So I'll have to wait and see, but I wouldn't be stunned in the slightest if Eva Marie returns tonight on Raw. 
We also have an update about a New Japan English language TV deal. Now, at the moment, of course, at the time of recording, Wrestle Kingdom is actually airing live in the Tokyo Dome. So we're not going to do any Wrestle Kingdom news today. We'll put those in tomorrow's video because I know obviously Wrestle Kingdom Night 2 is actually tomorrow. So I've undecided if we'll do Night 1 tomorrow and then maybe Night 2 the following day or maybe on Wednesday we just do everything that came out of Wrestle Kingdom. That might be the best thing to do. So stay tuned for that. Subscribe bottom right hand corner. But speaking of New Japan, New Japan is reportedly close to a new English language television deal. This is according to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Now, Meltzer reports that the deal is close enough that an announcement could come at any time, so maybe over the course of the next couple of days. Of course, from 2014 to 2019, New Japan had a television deal with Access TV. The deal ended when Access TV was purchased by Anthem Sports and Entertainment, the parent company of Impact Wrestling. Of course, Impact now airs on that same network, but it would be nice to have New Japan be back on a, an English language TV station. Now, Meltzer hasn't said what that station is, what that network is, but he would know, considering his ties to New Japan and just Japan in general. If Dave Meltzer is saying something about New Japan, it's probably quite close to happening. So as he mentioned, it could happen over the next couple of days. We'll have to wait and see, but it would be nice to see New Japan get a bit more of a footprint back over in America. Of course, they've got the global streaming service. They've got the New Japan of America shows, but the, I think so much was positive about having those New Japan shows in America. Even if it was a light footprint, it did help. And uh, I think it was Jim Ross did commentary on there, Don Callis, lots of names did it on there. And uh, it was a nice presentation. It was a nice presentation. There were obviously issues about the turnover of it and how late the shows were and stuff like that and how far behind actual what was happening in real life, that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, it would be nice to see New Japan back in an English language TV deal once again in the United States. Uh, we also have some news about the SmackDown ratings because everyone was paying attention to the SmackDown ratings this week because the Christmas Day edition of SmackDown, of course, was so strong in the ratings. But we are apparently back to normal at this point because the New Year's edition of SmackDown on Fox drew an average of 1.915 million overnight viewers, according to Showbuzz Daily. The show drew an average of a 0.5 rating in the 18 to 49 key demographic. This is down 42.6%, so nearly 50% from last week's overnight viewership for the Christmas Day edition of SmackDown, which drew an average of 3.336 million live viewers and down from the last week's final SmackDown viewership, actually it went down slightly from the overnight of 3.303 million live viewers. The final rating in the key demo for last week was 0.96. Of course, as I mentioned this week, it was 0.5. SmackDown actually did top the 18 to 49 demographic and the 18 to 34 demographic and the 25 to 54 demo. SmackDown ranked number eight for the night in viewership on network TV. Now, this isn't really surprising. I don't think anyone really truly thought that after SmackDown's so, so strong Christmas night edition uh, on Fox that we were going to see the same ratings this week because we just weren't. We, we really weren't. Obviously, it was New Year's Day. You've got the hangover, quite literally, of New Year's Eve. Furthermore, there were lots of factors why the Christmas Day edition of SmackDown was so strong in terms of viewership. I think the biggest was the lead-in. The lead-in they had on that Christmas Day edition of SmackDown, or the Christmas night edition of SmackDown, was that strong NFL game. It was the highest amount of people or the highest viewership uh, that they had an NFL game on Fox on Christmas Day since 2016. So you've got the highest amount of people watching a Fox uh, Christmas Day edition of the NFL for four years, essentially, uh, that amount of people then bled over into watching SmackDown on Fox following that. That's the reason why there was such a strong uh, first hour, especially for SmackDown last week. And I think and I think that explains the majority of it. Of course, there's other factors, three title matches, uh, a strongly promoted show that everyone knew what was going to happen in advance going into that show. But I think the biggest factor there was the strong leading of the NFL game. And obviously they didn't have that that week, uh, this week rather. Also a factor is you have to look at that Christmas Day edition of SmackDown. They had the strong leading, they had the strong first hour because of that strong leading. But the second hour, it dropped massively. It dropped massively to roughly about usual for SmackDown. And that would have been an indicator of what was to come this week. And it's exactly what happened. So we're back to normal <laughs> for SmackDown. So that huge number on Fox, I think SmackDown might be looking at it going... Can we get can we get NFL games all the time? Because that's what we really need. I mean, SmackDown Friday's a tough day anyway for TV. You know, 10 p.m. was it eight was it 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on a Friday? They mentioned millions of times. It's a tough one. Even during the pandemic, people don't really watch. So that's that's a difficult spot for SmackDown. Nevertheless, we're back to normal for SmackDown. Uh, we're nearly about floating around two million viewers. Is that what Fox wants for the show? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think when Fox signed that uh, billion dollar contract for five years with SmackDown was it back in 2018 
to start in 2019, I think they thought they were going to be getting the 3 million, um, you know, close to 3 million every week. That's not the case. That isn't the case for SmackDown. But obviously, there are uh, uh, omitting circumstances for that as well. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in 2021 for SmackDown's ratings. Finally, CM Punk has disagreed with Ric Flair calling Shawn Michaels the greatest worker ever. Now, former WWE champion CM Punk does not agree with the two-time Hall of Famer uh, Ric Flair's recent take that it's, quote, not arguable anymore that Michaels is the greatest in-ring performer in pro wrestling history. While promoting tonight's Raw Legends Night, Flair told WWE UK, quote, it's not arguable anymore. Shawn is the greatest worker in the history of our business. I think everybody would give that to him. However... Uh, Ric Flair did put his legendary rival Ricky Steamboat in the same class as Michaels. He said, quote, For my money in the ring, I put him and Ricky Steamboat as a class by themselves. I've always liked being around Sean. As far as a guy in the ring, I don't think anyone has anyone I don't think anyone has ever seen anybody better. But Punk, former WWE champion, took to Twitter on Sunday and responded to Flair's comments by posting a gif from the movie The Big Lebowski, in which the dude, Jeff Bridges, says, quote, Yeah, well, that's just like your opinion, man. So Punk didn't say who he thinks is the best worker of all time, but he doesn't think it's Shawn Michaels. That would lead me to ask you, watching this, who do you think is the greatest worker ever? Is it Shawn Michaels? Is it Ric Flair? Is it CM Punk? You can let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. It's certainly very interesting. I'm not going to touch that one. I'm not going to touch that one. Who's the greatest worker ever? I don't even like to say those things because I think it's so subjective that I don't even necessarily think my opinion really matters on it. I, my, my opinion on who's the best any period of time changes probably every day because I think it's that subjective. So I don't even know you know, if it's Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels is up there. Ric Flair's up there. There's a lot of people up there. CM Punk, is he in the conversation? Uh, maybe, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Um, it's very difficult to tell. It's very difficult to tell. And it's so subjective that I don't even like to comment on it that much because like I said, my opinion on it changes every single day. But of course, as always... This is just one man's opinion. What are your thoughts on the news stories that we've spoken about today? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I'll do my best to respond and reply to all of your comments. Really enjoy interacting with you guys, talking about WWE, AEW, Impact Wrestling, all things pro wrestling here on the channel. So be sure to drop a comment below, get involved with the community, or opinions are welcome. If you have enjoyed this video, please do smash a like on the like button. It really does help us out here on YouTube. Go up the rankings and get into people's recommendation feeds if they haven't seen our videos previously. But most importantly, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to Wrestle News 3. You can do that by clicking the bottom right hand corner of the screen right now or if you wait a few seconds there'll be a subscribe button at the end of this video along with another video for you to watch. Thank you very much for watching, listening, streaming or however you come across this video today and I'll speak for you again very very soon. Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.